You know the drill by now. This is a class from the 2023 HVACR Symposium. This class is about flammable refrigerants, and it gives you an update on everything that you need to know, at least at the juncture when this was made. A lot of things uh, are constantly changing, but this is a great conversation, and it's from three of the great minds in this space. Dr. Chuck Allgood from Comores, Don Gillis from Comores, and Jason Abjut from ESCO. So if you're worried about flammable refrigerants or you want to know more about how to prepare, this is the class for you. We're going to give you a quick update, a really quick update, uh, of what's going on with the transition to low GWP A2L refrigerants. Uh, and then Dr. Chuck will move in, we'll talk about flammability characteristics and then We'll be followed with Don, who will get into some of the things that you should know. Uh, and with that, let's kick it off. Let's get started. <clears throat> As you know, we're in the middle of a transition. When does it start? Well, it started last year, and we're continuing on. The standards have been updated, both design and installation, and there's been regulatory updates as well. So one of the questions that comes up is, do I still need a 608? Yes, you do. To buy these refrigerants, store these refrigerants, transport, work with, you still need the Section 608 certification. You still need to recover these refrigerants, all right, the A2L low GWPs. Some of these refrigerants may also have layers of other regulations, such as in California where you can't use 404A, so there may be state level requirements as well. The AIM Act is what started all of this. It was a federal regulation that passed through both chambers of uh, Congress, signed by the President, and it mandated that the EPA phase down these HFCs, all right? How much? Well, in the end, 85%. We started with 10% last year, and in 2024, it'll jump to 40%, leaving only 60% of the, the market share. That's a big jump. So we're going to see these refrigerants slowly start to phase down. It's not a phase out, it's a phase down. There will be gas left for service, but it's gonna be on us to recover these refrigerants and bring them in for reclamation to help keep that price down. So here is sort of the, uh, the timeline of when these phase downs happen. We saw in 2022 here, 2022, that we had a 10%. And in 2024, we're going to hit that 40%. And in the end, it'll be, again, 85%. It is a step down with some big cliffs in there. And one of the big cliffs is coming next year. These refrigerants that we're going to be discussing up here are SNAP approved. What that means is... The EPA has approved them for use in specific applications, all right? There have been two SNAP rulings, SNAP 23, which approved these refrigerants, these six, for use in comfort cooling, which is what we're going to see. If you look next to R32, you'll see that little cross there. That means this isn't the first round for R32. It's already been approved for something else. Back in 2015, we started having R32 in window units, all right? A lot of us didn't notice. There might have been some stickers on the box, a little flame symbol, but it kind of went over smooth. No one really questioned it. But it's been since 2015 we've had an A2L in our window units, our package units. SNAP 25 approved these refrigerants for commercial refrigeration, industrial processes. You'll see 1234YF on there as well. That's going to be a big one moving forward. It's going to be a big part of the industry, whether it's a direct refrigerant in the system or it's part of a blend of refrigerants that are released to uh, hit these specific applications. So SNAP 23 and SNAP 25 approved these A2Ls for use in the field in specific applications. Having said that, now that they're approved, we need the installation and design standards so that everything is safe. Um, a lot of people question and say, well, what are we doing with these flammable refrigerants? Why are we changing? Listen, nobody up here wrote that, that legislation, none of us had a vote in that. It happened way above our head and it kind of rolled down. All right, all we're doing is that communication thing that Brian talked about, bringing it to you, kind of in English a little bit, more so in the, you know, from the engineering and codes and standards speak. So the standards have been updated to include these, all right? We have to have safety. We bring, if you're from the north where I'm from, we bring in methane, natural gas. We pipe it into the house. We pipe it into this machine, and then we set it on fire. And that's how we stay warm in the winter. And no one bats an eye. All right, why? There's safety built into that machine, right? 
there's a rollout switch, there's a pressure switch, there's a limit switch, there's an auxiliary, there's all of these redundant safeties built in to prevent the unit from operating in an unsafe manner. Y'all run in service vans. Y'all, I said y'all from the north. <laughs> y'all running, yeah! <clears throat> running in service vans. You pull up to the gas station and you put 32 gallons of an A3 fluid into your service vehicle and then you sit on it when you drive to the next service call and you don't bat an eye. We send our 18 year old kid to the gas station with a 30 pound tank, walks in, gets a 30 pound tank of propane, puts it in the trunk, drives home, brings it in the yard and sets it on fire to cook. We don't bat an eye. All of these things have safety and in their application and in their design. And these standards are that safety. So ASHRAE has standards for the installation, maintenance, service, safely of these refrigerants. They have been updated. ASHRAE is actually 15 and 15.2 have been updated in 2022. And again, it tells us the expectations for installation, service, maintenance, those sorts of things. On the design side, UL has standards for how these systems need to be designed so that they don't run, in, we don't have a, an ignition event, so to speak. All right, we're not gonna say explosion or fire or burn, we're gonna call it an ignition event. <laughs> so we have two standards there, uh, 2-40 and 2-89, that have been updated. And we'll see in two, yeah, the laser. 2-89 uh, actually incorporates some A3 refrigerants and we've seen higher charge limits in the new 2-89 for propane, isobutane, those sorts of things in quartered appliances. 2-40 was for, again, our air conditioners, dehumidifiers, heat pumps, those sorts of things. They have been updated. So we have updated installation and maintenance standards. We have updated design standards. And again, this is all driven by regulatory to phase down HFCs. So far, so good? Am I going too fast? I've had a lot of coffee. All right. <laughs> the one caveat to this is that this transition is happening at an uneven pace. So the codes, the standards, of even the building codes have been updated to incorporate all of this. Now it is up to the states at the state level to update their building codes to the newest versions to include these. Some states are ahead of others. In some states, you can walk into your supply house and buy these refrigerants and these refrigerant systems already. In other states, like, no, 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 don't bring that here, not yet. All right, it's coming, it's gonna have to come, all right? We're, we're phasing these refrigerants down um, and we're seeing, again, the two L's come out. If you look at this map, it kind of breaks down. Again, these are dated slides. There's real-time maps online that kind of show you where the different states are, uh, who allows it, who doesn't. For a better picture, we can look at this one. If you look at the striped states there, the striped ones have already updated their codes for both air conditioning and refrigeration which means A2Ls are already part of the code for both the refrigeration sector and the air conditioning comfort cooling sector. If you look at the blue, they've done their AC, they're still working on the refrigeration. If you look at the yellow, they're in the process, they're in committee, they have things written to get the ball rolling, to get these standards updated. And if you look at the white, they're, they're a little behind. So this, I, and that's the nice way of saying it, that they have to get off the schneid and start doing something. All right, again, this is a living document. There, this might be updated tomorrow, all right? <clears throat> so there's live versions of this. If you go to the AHR, uh, AHRI website, there's an SRTTF. Just remember that, Google, SRTTF, and boom, it comes right up. There's a link for a map. The map, you can hover over the states and it'll tell you what they're doing, when they did it, that sort of thing. These are just screen grabs of the maps. So some of you, again, Brian said you come from all over the place. <clears throat> Some of you can walk into a supply house right now and buy this stuff. Some of you, your state's like, yeah, 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 we're not, no, no, not yet, not us, whoa. <laughs> Any questions on the regulatory side before I hand it off to Dr. Chuck here who's gonna get into some of the properties of these flammable refrigerants, these A2Ls and A3s. <clears throat> so again, this is coming. Uh, it started up here, we didn't start it. <clears throat> All right, we're bringing it to you. This is, there's no turning back at this point. So far, so good? All right, I'm going to hand it off right. to Dr. Chuck. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chuck Allgood. I'm with uh, the Camores Company. If you're not familiar with Camores, we were the spin-off unit from uh, DuPont. So historically, we were the inventors of Freon back close to 100 years ago. We continue to uh, operate that business, uh, support the refrigeration industry. I, I am a chemist by training. I'm not an engineer. So all that stuff Brian said about engineers being nice and kind and <coughs> smart, you can, can ignore that and make your own judgments here. Uh, Don, who will follow up with me with the real practical hands-on stuff, is also with Camores. But uh, we're glad to support the uh, symposium and be here. Um, that little caricature there of me, that was uh, you know, a, a hang-on from the COVID days when we couldn't get out and train. Someone said, why don't you make some YouTube videos? So a lot of the cool stuff about flammables, you can see, it's better to see in person, see things burn if you're into that kind of stuff. So there are some videos online that actually will show some of these things live. So I would just refer you to that. But I want to take a few minutes here just to talk about the properties of the refrigerants themselves, the fluids uh, that we use uh, in the past, we're using today, we'll be moving to in the future. So hopefully uh, you've seen a chart of this version here. This is matrix is based off of ASHRAE standard 34, the refrigerant safety uh, standard. And it, it's a letter and numbering system. So A and B is the toxicity. It's just two classes, lower toxicity, higher toxicity. Just about everything you've worked on, unless you're an ammonia guy, has probably been a class one. I, I mean, a class A in toxicity, lower toxicity. I think 123 big low pressure chillers uh, were also a class B. Um, and flammability wise, we've pretty much been in the one, which colloquially we will say non-flammable, but according to standard, it's no flame propagation. And that's important distinction I'll talk a little bit about later. So we've been down in that lower left uh, A1 category, things like 134A, 410A, R22, all uh, A1 refrigerants. And with some of the environmental pressures and the regulations that Jason kind of gave an overview, there's a lot of detailed regulations around that. But we're moving the industry to lower GWP molecules, which means we're going to go up in flammability. And so the, the new classification, it's, it's been around for a few years now, maybe 10 years, is this 2L. So it's Fairly flammable, it, we call it mildly flammable, lower, uh, lower flammability is the standard language. As opposed to if you get up way up in that class three, that's a uh, highly flammable. So that's where the hydrocarbons are, propane, acetylene, butane. Can I get a show of hands? People work with propane, anyone? Fair number of people. And they've always been what? Small, you know, 150 gram, self-contained, factory charged, pretty safe pieces of equipment. Uh, to work on. They are moving the charge sizes up a little bit uh, for A3s and some of the new standards and codes. So we'll be getting bigger systems out there with uh, propane in them, something to keep in mind. But one thing I want to do today is show you a little bit of the differences in terms of the actual gases of what uh, one flammability versus a 2L versus a 3 look like. And at the heart of that is this flask over here. So this gets the nerdy chemistry side of things going. But this is kind of the test we do back in the laboratories. I got about 30 years uh, with DuPont and Camores, and we got a lot of really smart people who wear the lab coats, and I get to come out and, and do this fun stuff and, and hang out with all you guys. But uh, the basic flammability test is a big flask here. I think it's about two liters. I don't know if it says on there. It's about the size of a basketball, you sent, and it's got an electrode in the middle of it. So you fill it up with a mixture of gas and air, and you ignite it, and you see what happens. And you keep doing that, changing the mixture. And if, the, if you get to a flammable concentration, and I'll show you how flammability is determined in a second here, that's what determines if something is flammable or not. So it, there's some, some degrees of, of uh, separation here that aren't that great. So if, this is a picture of that actual flask. We do it in the dark so we can measure what we call the flame propagation. And that's a 90 degree angle there that is external on the side, that V. But this is an A1 refrigerant. So this is class one. This could be 134A or 410. So the first point is when you ignite it, you do get some combustion right around where the ignition source is. Same way if you had your torch and you get it into an area where you had enough of even 134A or 410, you may see what we call flame enhancement. The flame may grow. You can generate some decomposition products that don't smell too good. They aren't something you want to get up your, your snoot. So you always got to be careful around with a torch around any refrigerant. That's the second point I want to make. But if the flame reaches from side to side on that 90-degree uh, angle, then it's determined that that's flammable. If it doesn't make it, it's non-flammable. So that one there just doesn't quite make it if you look on the right side. 
but you put a class 2L in. So this could be like 454B, which is uh, Camor's replacement for 410. It's going to be coming out, R32, other ones. That is uh, 2L flammable. So again, third point, not a big difference in how these things actually look in this test. So the, we're pretty uh, small degrees of separation, as I said. That's one of the take home messages today, too. The, the 2Ls, in a lot of ways, are going to be like the A1s. Uh, some notable differences, you need to know about it, you need to understand it, you got to have the right tools, Don will cover all that. But 2Ls are a lot more like 1s than they are at class 3. So that's propane. So you can just see it just consumed immediately the whole flask. World of difference between a 1 and 2L and a 3. So if we look beyond just does it, is it flammable, these are some of the things, does it burn or not according to that first test, then you look at some of the physical properties and it gets into combustion science and that type of thing. But we look at things like burning velocity and heat of combustion and this is all part of the standard. Um, but you can see down there in the middle something like minimum ignition energy. That's how much of a spark does it take to light this thing off. If you would have a leak and you have the right composition because there is a lower flammability limit and upper flammability, you could be too lean, not have enough fuel, too much oxygen. You could have too much fuel, be too rich and so it wouldn't burn. But if you're in that window of flammability, then how much ignition energy do you need? So the minimum ignition energy, is, it, is this a birthday candle? Do I, is it a torch? Or can static electricity from uh, you know, walking across the room on a day without much humidity uh, set this off? My tools, uh, electri <coughs> electrical switches, that type of thing. So you can see the difference there in minimum ignition energy between um, something that's a 2L and something that's at three, the three zero point two five. That you know, uh, any kind of ignition source around a competent mixture of propane is going to ignite it off. Two Ls take a lot more energy, and that's why they're a different classification. Burning velocity is how fast does the flame propagate? Once we get it ignited, does it take off like a blowtorch, a ball of fire, or does it burn like a birthday candle? And you can see the differences in the numbers there. And then finally, heat of combustion down at the bottom. That's how much energy. Does this give off when it burns? Again, is it, uh, is it a lot? Is it a little? Is it somewhere in between? So you can see across the board how these impact you know, the risk that you're going to be facing uh, when you install these. And a lot of these numbers and this science here is what went into developing the proper safety standards and then into the building code. So you want something that's hard to ignite. It doesn't give off a good flame when it does and it doesn't do a lot of damage if it does burn. That's kind of where the two L's land. So again, a lot like the A1's, but they are considered flammable. They have to be treated that way. Any questions about this? I know there's a lot of data and a lot of units here, but I kind of explained the practical side. Yes, sir. I was the two category split between two and two L. Um, it, it, it was in the ASHRAE standard. I think there was a need to look at the uh, different fluids that were available. And, and what would make sense, uh, I'm not answering this question too well, but they wanted some differentiation so they could make some choices. This is okay for a two, this is a two L. There's really not a lot of two refrigerants out there in a practical sense. I think R152A, which is, uh, it's used in aerosol propellants and stuff, not really big in the refrigeration. It's used to component in some old blends, but for practicality purposes, we were either a three or a one historically. So now we're at two L. So again, the, the risk is minimized with two L's. That's the whole reason we're going to two L's and not to three in something like a, a, the HVAC industry. So again, if we put all this together, where does that end up as we're transitioning the industry into two L's? They're less likely, if they do leak, to form flammable concentration. They're harder to ignite. As one of my chemist friends says, if you were trying to make a fire you, with two L's, you'd be probably disappointed just for these reasons. It's really tough to ignite them. They don't burn very well if they do. So we can get bigger charge sizes. The reason propane historically was at 150 grams maximum charge size, the assumption was if it all leaks out into a typical room, you're still going to be below the lower flammability uh, concentration because there's just tons of ignition sources around for something like propane. With two L's, it's going to take a lot more of the fluid to leak out into a given space Therefore, you can put bigger charge sizes in when you're doing the risk mitigation. 
Uh, Don, are you going to cover the uh, tools and that kind of stuff? I am. And, okay. Yeah. I, w I won't go into that. I'll save that for Don. But uh, there are not a lot of ignition sources for 2L, so a lot of the equipment and stuff you have is going to remain the same. And finally, if worst case worse, you do have a leak, you do reach a flammable concentration, there is a significant uh, ignition source, the overall event is going to be, as, as event, Jason called yes. it, the event is going to be less severe just because they're less energetic material. All right, I'm going to hand All it over right. to Don here. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, let's hear it for yeah. Chuck. <laughs> Great job, Chuck. Great job, Jason. So uh, what I took away from that uh, is uh, uh, there's a big difference between A3s and A2Ls. Uh, A2Ls is a new kid on the block, you know, just a little bit, not necessarily to do with my presentation, but, you know, up until 10 years ago, there wasn't two Ls, right? In fact, it was such a mild flame propagation. Obviously, I'm in Chuck's world now. He's the chemist. I'm, I'm just a contractor, but uh, they actually recertified ammonia. They went from B2 to B2L uh, because, the, you know, they said, well, if that's an A2L, then we should be a B2L. So just a fun fact about that. Again, I'm Don Gillis, uh, been with Comores about five months or so. Some of you might remember me as the trainer for Copeland or Emerson for quite a few years. Uh, I know I've met a lot of you. I uh, want to say kudos to the people that were taking notes throughout that all. I was just blown away. It's, uh, it's, it, and Brian said it so well, the people that come to this event, they're really here to learn. So uh, thanks for doing that. So I want to establish one thing real quick. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir. That's why you're here. There are no hydrocarbons in A2Ls. And the only reason I'm saying that to you is not everybody goes to training like you're doing today, and I hear this thing all the time. Well, man, I don't want to mess with that. I don't want to mess with this. You know, why do they have to be flammable and those kind of things? So the second thing I want to establish is pretty simple stuff here. If you don't know already, the A2Ls that are coming out, you will not be able to put them in any existing equipment right now. Okay? So let's refer to it as the legacies, or as Chuck said and Jason said, A1 classification. That will not be retrofitted into any existing systems, okay? And, and now the father in me is going to kick in, because uh, I do have a 37-year-old that is a HVAC licensed contractor, uh, like I was, uh, is don't do it. It's not worth your liability. Even if the flame propagation is really, really small, it's not worth it, okay? Uh, it's just not worth it. Plus, you don't know what you're leaving behind, somebody to walk up onto. So be safe. Do the right thing, okay? All right, enough of that. All right. Like Jason said, he hit it quite well already. R32, A2Ls have been around us already for a long time. If you bought a car in the last six, seven years, you got 1234YF in it, okay? It replaced it with R34, okay? Also, as he mentioned, R32 and PTEC units slapped a lot of those in the back in the day. Those have, those have R32 in it, okay? Uh, a lot of that's Asian driven, so it's been out there for a long time. So it's around us already, so you're just not aware of it. I know when I started speaking about refrigerants like seven years ago, it was a lot of deer in the headlight stuff on A2Ls and those kind of things, hydrocarbons. Uh, but now it seems like everybody's really inquisitive about it. It's getting closer. The window's closing on us, okay? And uh, that's why you're here today. Uh, so I'm going to get into the tanks. Some of this is hot off the press. So I'm just the messenger. We'll field some questions. It looks like we're going to have plenty of time. A lot of knowledge up here on the stage, okay? To the, to the left, A1 classification, what we use all the time, the stuff we're comfortable, the 134As, the R22s, everything that we've talked about before, 410As. We used to have the relief valve on there. It was a ruptured disc, right? Everybody know ruptured disc, okay? And the purpose of the ruptured disc was, let's say it was in your van and it got way too hot in there. Let's say above 130 degrees or whatever that was designed for, and it went off. If you don't know, and you've never had one go off, which that's a good thing, uh, it releases the whole charge on the tank, right? With the new tanks, even though it's a slow, very low flame propagation, you're going to have a relief, a spring-loaded relief type valve on it, okay, which is to the right. That's what it's going to look like, all right? So that'll go off long enough to relieve the pressure that's needed and close on itself, okay? Just so, just in case, Something could, the planets line perfectly and something happens. So that's one of the biggest safety features you'll be seeing on the new tanks. All right? Any, I'm going to take all these. Any questions right off the top of your head right now? Yeah, go ahead. I understand we might be going to just refillable tanks and not throwaway tanks. Yeah. So 
what his question was for those of you at home listening in was he understands they're going to be going to refillable tanks. There is talk of that. Uh, it looks like it could be possible. I know some people are fighting it right now. Uh, the biggest problem I know, and hopefully I'm not letting any uh, top secret information, I don't think I am, it's out in the news, is there's real concern about getting all those tanks made, okay? Uh, there's just not uh, 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 enough manufacturers to put that many uh, you know, cylinders like that, refillable cylinders, out at one time at the dates that they're proposing. So it's probably going to be on, either put back or a little bit on hold, I guess is the better way to put it. But yes, th that is a proposal. So, but, but uh, I, I just if you just look at the statistics, it's going to be a while. But yes. Will they change the fittings on these tanks? Yes. So I, I, that's part of my, hold that thought for just a second. Let me, let me, I got about three slides and once I touch these three slides, I might answer your questions. But that's a great question. I like the way you're thinking. And I appreciate the questions too, by the way. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm going to go ahead and answer his questions then too. He's got one here too. Yeah. Okay. So with that uh, spring loaded relief, is that if it's similar to like a propane tank, is our blevies a concern? What was the what was some if, concern? If it, ha it has a spring loaded relief like a propane tank, are blevies a concern? I I don't know. If, uh, boiling liquid expanding levy. vapor. If 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 the tank was to be yeah. exposed to high heat, I don't know if that's a concern with this ref refrigerant. I understand the question. I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah. But Blevy is a boiling liquid expanding yeah. volume. Yeah. It's, it's one of those yeah. turns into like a popcorn yeah. in the tank, right? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be more Chuck questions, though. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> About possible change in fittings, like the fitting, will they, if they do change the fitting, will it be like the exact same as the automotive left hand Acme thread? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and address that question now. It's a perfect time. We'll knock it out of the park here. Uh, so it's so right now this is f hot off the press okay we literally made the first model two weeks ago somewhere around that Chuck Chuck's heavily involved in that end I you know I get I get fed that information is we are going to go with left-handed threads on the tank okay uh, not all the manufacturers have uh, have uh, decided they're going to go with left-handed hose threads I think what you're going to see from what we understand is there's going to be some type of an ad adapter now, what does the adapter do? People are saying, why in the heck do you go with left hand? Is this another tool we have to buy? Look, there's someone like myself 31 years ago that jumped in a truck and was cleaning up job sites and carrying somebody's tools that's starting every day in the industry. It's one more step that they got to take that hopefully it'll put in their head. Oh, for some reason, my gauges aren't going on this thread. Oh, that's right. This is an A2L and that's an A1. You know what I'm saying? So as little as it seems to you with all the savvy people in the, in the room, it's, it, it may help somebody else, okay? Look, I've walked up on job sites before when we transferred to 22 to 410A. I'm not, I, I love telling my, my mistakes because I learned from them. And I remember starting to charge the darn thing in R22 and realized I had, uh, it was 410 in it. And I, and I did do that, I had to evacuate everything. So that's kind of the reason. And hopefully that answered your questions on that, okay? Yeah. We had one more, Don. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, and I got a slide for that too. So Don't. instead of that disc, uh, you're, yeah. you're going you're gonna to use like a, something non-spark, preferably like a brass of some sort, and uh, puncture it. But it's it's it, nothing's been in written that it has to be this or that. But I do have a good visual for you to see here. And just great questions. Love the questions. Good Don't stuff. Don't puncture the relief valve. A spring loaded yeah, relief. You'll yeah. shoot your eye out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's. That's going to be changed, but a great question. I deeply appreciate you asking that. It's very pop. That's why I'm going to touch on here a little bit. Good stuff, gang. Okay, so here, hot off the press, you're the first people to see this, publicly see this. So omit the one down there in the far bottom right side, okay, with the red cap. There was two alternatives, red band or red cap. No one else was making a decision. Camor has decided, since we have most of the refrigerants that are out there, uh, the patents on all the, you know, the Freons and what have you. We went with the red stripe. That picture up at the top, left-hand side, is actually just sent to me last week, and I popped it in there. That is what it's going to look like, cut and dry. You see the puncture mark there in the center of the tank? As Jason said, you're not going to hit the ruptured disc now because there's not a ruptured disc there anymore. You're going to punk it in the side there, just like that, to de-arm it, uh, decommission it, okay? Uh, uh, they'll have that red band around them. I got red top because there was a con there was a, 
a question whether they were going to go. They were still taking ideas, decide what would jump out best at it. So if you see a red band around it, and all those tanks, by the way, if someone hasn't mentioned already, they're all going to a neutral color, okay? It's all going to a neutral color. And, and, and some people, I've seen other presenters joke about like, hey, they ran out of colors. But the truth of the matter is, there's, some, there's truth to that. And the reason there's, but we're, on the serious side of it is, they don't want anything to be kind of blue and a little bit different blue. And you grab, you see what I'm saying? Because how many times, I mean, I've grabbed a lot of refrigerant out of trucks before in the heat of the battle, especially in air conditioning. I mean, their heat pumps are not so much, but people are complaining and, and you, they gripe it and they got to get their air on, right? So that's the reason for those colors. You're going to have a plain tank or a plain tank with a red ribbon around it or a red stripe. It'll also be stamped with what refrigerant's on it, okay? So it'll tell you what's on there, all right? Anything I missed there? Oh, counterfeit shrink wrap on the top of it. It'll have like a foil wrap on it. Uh, to protect it as far as to let you know that it's not counterfeit. And I know that probably s doesn't sound like a big deal to you, uh, but I've learned a lot in the five months I've been here on some of these samples they take from other refrigerants coming from wherever, uh, and they do a test on it, and it's not even the, the right blend. There's a little of this and a little bit of that. So if you're scratching your head on a job site sometime and you bought some, uh, you know, something crazy, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, Frankenstein refrigerant sometimes, and you can't get your PT charts to jive up, that's why, okay? So just be aware of it, shrink wrapped on the top there, uh, you got, it's pure, it, more than likely it's, it's good stuff, okay? All right, did I miss anything? All right. Go, yeah, go ahead. You said it'll be stamped, not like written? Uh, it's gonna be, help me out here. Is it, the, 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 uh, the, the refrigerant, is it stamped on the tank or is it, uh, is it? It'll be printed, printed like on standard it. Yeah. label. The color will just be, yeah. it's like Battleship there Gray. I, I don't know if some of you noticed, there's four 10A tanks holding all of the, uh, the tents in place. And if you look, some of those tanks are still pink, but if you look at the other ones, they're the neutral color that Dan was talking about. They're yeah. that RAL green gray color. Yeah. Uh, everybody's going to this, the, the tanks, yeah. no matter what it is. If it's 134A, 404A, yeah. 407C, R32, R454B, they're all going to be that neutral color. Yeah. You're going to be forced to read the label. Yes. Which is a good thing. You're going to be forced to read the label. That's a good thing. Yeah, actually, in, in a instructor group on Facebook that I, I helped uh, administer with, along with Jason, uh, there was a question in there from an instructor, and he showed the picture of the right. tank. And he said, this was just sent to me. Is this is real this stuff? Right. So we had to go through the process to explain them, and then everybody started chiming in, other instructors from around the world of, yeah, that's what they're going to, and here's why. So it started a good conversation. Go ahead. Just a question on the, uh, sorry, just a question on the printing on the tank. Yeah. Is there any changes in the ink? The reason I say is I've had cylinders in my truck mm -hmm. that after a few months of sliding them in and out of the metal cylinder container, mm -hmm. that ink is gone. Yeah. But I, I could yeah, stare at a right. pink cylinder, a green cylinder, a blue cylinder, and an orange cylinder and go, got yeah. it. Yeah. So that's why I think the reason about stamping came up is realistic world, two, three months in a truck, that, that printing is gone. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's why there's yeah. those other, uh, like the left-handed thread that he had spoke of was one of the things that'll clue you in that, hey, this is, this is something different. Uh, and then the other recommendation is to mm. keep it in the box because the box is going to have all the warnings and the safety information on yeah. there as long as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that feedback. I hadn't heard anything about yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I have, and it's been a lot of, only because I'm in all these groups and trying to help other people out and people helping me. And, but yeah, that's been brought up a lot. And my next picture kind of shows that, what you're talking about, sitting in there, scraping, coming out, because that's, that's typical of what a truck, or at least what I drove anyways, what a truck looked like back 100 years ago. Uh, expectation of the technicians to keep that cylinder in the box yeah. right uh, it's yeah. just not gonna happen I mean yeah. I, I think a couple of workarounds would be either the stamping or that ink needs to be printed on the top near the handle where it's not gonna rub off but yeah. around the yeah. perimeter of the tank is just not a good place yeah. for that to be indicated on. yeah and it's been that's been brought up so many times and, and usually if somebody says like that in the box and uh, no offense to one out there because that's probably the proper way to do it because you still have uh, it's just coming from 24 years in a truck of my 31 years. It's not realistic. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. And you, you, you're you're preaching to the choir, and I'm preaching to the choir, and and we all get it. So that's any time something's new, and I think Brian did a good job of defusing it. 
we're just the messengers. We have to try to transition. I mean, we all transitioned from R12 to R22 to four. I remember, believe me, this transition, my personal opinion, come back in five years and tell me if I was full of crap or not. Uh, I think the transition from 410A to 454B is going to be much smoother to A2Ls than it was when we went from R22 to 410A. I, 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 I feel strongly about that. We never saw those pressures. I remember going in the sheet metal room the, reason, the morning they flipped up a, a, a screen and said, you're all going to get certified for this new thing called Puron. And we all took the test and we all passed. We went out in the trucks and we're freaking out about these pressures that are going to be in our truck. Does anybody remember that? I mean, it was just like yesterday, but it's been, you know, 410A has been around 30 years. The oil, too. We went from mineral to POE. Exactly. That was a big deal. Uh, 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 using nitrogen while you were brazing. How much that changed because of PO oil, you know, being a, like a solvent almost. But anyways, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Great questions. Um, I, too, had too much coffee. Uh, <laughs> under the material trades, it's uh, business as usual. Material trades, were, I'm starting to use some fancy words here. Same restrictions as, as place as 440 pounds, regardless of hazard. Now, the federal placards are required for, sir, uh, not required for service vehicles. Uh, for transportation, there is. And I don't know, I don't think there's anybody here for transportation, okay? Uh, we're still talking about, they're still <laughs> talking about them going on horizontal. I don't want to get in the weeds to here too much, but there was some concerns of having, not having a barrier, uh, a vapor barrier between that. But uh, as much as I can say right now, it passed the test. It just needs to be resubmitted, okay? So no concerns there. But as of right now, it's still upright like A1s actually are, right? I mean, still are supposed to be anyways. So I want you to focus. I'm, uh, I have a bad angle here. The, what I'm really going to hit on here, because I'm running out of time, is I want you to look at the things in red, okay? So when we look at the things in red, I'm going to go, everything else, uh, I can assure you, is the same. When we go to the reds, purging circuit with inert gas, nitrogen, uh, not required in A1s. Should be good practices, but not required. On A2Ls, it'll be required, okay? So stay tuned for that. Uh, the, sec the third one down, evacuate the circus. Wasn't required, but that was good practice. But now it's going to be required, okay? There's going to be a little more of that stuff going on. Down to the leak and pressure test, not required. Uh, always, you, always considered good practice, okay? But now it will be required, okay? All right? Uh, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is like for like. What's the difference between evacuate circuit and evacuate the system? Is evacuate circuit? The refrigerant circuit. Yeah. B before you're doing work on it? Y yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Versus, Purging any versus... possibility of it, any, uh, what am I trying to say? The, uh, re yes, residual gas in there. Yeah. Okay. Down, yeah. To, down to zero PSI or whatever the EPA requirements are for the pressure and charge. Remember the EPA recovery efficiency chart? Another question I have about recovery tanks. Are we going to be able to use our existing recovery tanks to recover A2L into it? I'm going to touch on that too. So some tools are going to be, there, there isn't, you know, like scales are going to stay the same. There is going to be, everything's going to have to go be to A2L pr uh, approved. Now, with that said, I'm not here to sell tools. I don't even sell tools and the tool maker's not but they have to be recertified. There are some situations, as I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, that manufacturers are offering you to send that in. Appion's one of those. Our local Appion guy and I are pretty good friends, uh, do a lot of recovery together. Um, you can send it back in and be recertified. It's, I guess what I'm saying is there's little to no change, but you should at least get it checked out, okay? But the new equipment, just like gauges, when they changed to 410A, it said, you know, 410A approved and the, and the recovery tanks. Recovery tanks will stay the same as far as I know. Yeah, there'll be okay. a, at first there'll be a decal that you get from the supply house to stick on it, but eventually when the supply chain catches up, they'll put a red stripe on it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so the recovery tanks, that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I sort of danced around a little bit, didn't I? The pressures are the same that we're seeing now with, so R32, R454, B, are very similar to 410A. So if a tank can handle the pressure of 410A, it can handle the pressure of R32 or R454B. Yeah, yeah. Most of it's going to be business as usual, but uh, you will start to see A2L approved, A2L certified, and those kind of things on a lot of the tools, okay? All right? There's a bunch of those outside today, by the way. If you walk around to the booth, you'll see it says A2L it's already approved saying, on a lot of these tools yeah. that you see out here. Yeah, 
yeah, there really wasn't a lot of change at the uh, factories. They just identified as being okay, so there wasn't any confusion. So, good question. So, coming to the end here, A2L Equipment Servicing. Here's just to, to name a few. I don't have any connection with any of these. We're not in that market. Uh, Appion, Yellow Jacket, NAVAC. And uh, when in doubt, as we always say, check with the component manufacturer. Check with the manufacturer anytime you're in doubt, okay? Always, always check with the manufacturer. A lot of documentation. I know it's a small read there. It's too hard for you to see and what have you, but uh, uh, all those things I found easily online, uh, and you can do the same thing. If you really want to know about refrigerants, uh, my shameless plug, Dr. Chuck's being humble. Go to YouTube. Check up with Dr. Chuck. He breaks down just the simplest things in two minutes. They're short little, you know, not long, uh, boring videos on what those letters and numbers even mean in a, what the refrigerant you're using and just different things, okay? It's pretty cool stuff. You'll really, really like it. Uh, my name's Don Gillis. You can get a hold of me if you ever have questions. Don. Uh, Don.Gillis at Camores.com, okay? Did I miss anything? Uh, 290. Used to teach a lot of 290. Uh, as it's already been mentioned, it's going to go from 150 grams, uh, which is equivalent of about 5.2 ounces. Uh, you'll start seeing that, and I think it's uh, proposed now to 350 and 500. Yeah. 500 will be open cases. Uh, 350, uh, somewhere thereabout, will be anything with a door or drawer. So the more potential of gas being trapped, because it is an A3, we cook on the grill with it, right? Uh, it, if it, there's more potential to get trapped in there, it'll be less charged. Everybody understand that? Pretty easy stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything I'm missing on that, Jason? No, I, I think uh, okay. just be prepared that, again, the, the, the charge sizes for these quartered appliances is going to go up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, any, we'll open it up to questions now. Okay. Everybody have questions. And if there's anything online, shoot it on in. I talk too much. I had... Uh, shame on them for giving me two coffees. That was their fault, okay? Do we Jason? have any uh, additional questions? Yeah. Yes. How long do you think it'll be before Yellow Jacket comes out with a little fan? <laughs> well, that's a good point. There's some of the, so what happens if I'm doing service and one of these systems is locked out because of a leak or if I'm working in commercial equipment in a machine room and I have an active sensor that indicates a leak? Well, I don't go charging in there with my cape and say, yeah, I'm here to fix this. You got to ventilate that area first. So some sort of a fan to ventilate before you, again, enter that area. And keep in mind, anything with enough parts per million will kill you. Right. Even CO2 at 15,000 parts per million, million, if it's not ventilated, will kill you. Okay? R410A. But you just use good practices, as, as Jason said. So... Where do we find out more about this? There's a lot of information out there. A lot of people are saying, well, this is new. Well, this really isn't new. This has been coming for quite some time. There is a lot of training available already. You're here getting some today. Uh, but where I work at the ESCO group, we do have a training program. There's a manual, uh, a book, an e-book. Uh, there's a closed cert uh, book certification exam on it that you can take online or uh, uh, in paper. <coughs> And I'll get to the, okay, there's a picture of the book and the e-course and things like that. But there's also some links that you can go to here. There's links and you can scan those codes. Again, for more information, you can go to Option.com or you can go to Camores or you can go to ESCO Group. Also, remember I told you, go to Uncle Google and put in SRTTF. That's the AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force. Dr. Chuck Donnan. Comores, they've given us tons of information to put on that site. All of that information is from the manufacturer. It's free to download, and it's all highly accurate. It's straight from the horse's mouth. All right, it comes from the standards committees. It comes from the manufacturers and the OEMs. Oh, we just got the flag that we got five minutes left, so. We got a question Greg, down yonder? Yeah, I get a question down there. Just a couple of questions on, uh, you touched on the pressures. They're going to be about the same that we're looking at? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then, Flushing out a system if we're going to be using, reusing a line set from an r 410 a Okay, that's a good question. He asked about flushing the system so I can mm. use the same lines. Okay, one, it has to be allowed in your local jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions will allow it, some won't. Two, it has to meet the standards, ASHRAE 15 or 15.2. Uh, in certain residential applications, you're going to have to, if it's inside of a wall, a soffit, you're going to have to open up and show that it's protected with striker plates 
Uh, it's got to be tested for to be sound, leak proof. That if it passes and meets the standards and it's allowed in your local you know jurisdiction, then yes. Yeah, and some of you are. Is anybody under codes right now that you have to use striker plates? Because I've been using striker plates for 25 years. As I'm still holding my license for journeyman card for. Do in we the know county what striker am. plates are? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty common. The plumbers use them all the time. Go ahead. Who has liability in the event of an event? Yeah, yeah. Yet to be determined. It depends on what caused the event. Was it someone overcharging, pounded way more refrigerant in there? It should have been in there. Was it a manufacturer defect? Uh, did the homeowner run into it with the driving lawnmower? That sort of thing. It depends on why that event happened. So are we going to educate customers? Are yeah, we yeah. As we said, yeah. the, uh, no, the insurance thing, let me ask you this. How many people's car insurance went up when we put 1234YF in the car? Or your homeowner's insurance. When you go to Best Buy and you buy a refrigerator, it comes with isobutane or propane, A3. Did your homeowner's insurance go up? So, so, so we want something I want to add for you because I think I always still think like a contractor, like I said, because I talk to my son all the time. I know Titus, I know quite a few people, other, more, I still think like that, is what we don't know yet that's interesting, that's a missing link here, we're only talking about refrigerants is all your OEMs that are going to 454B and those kind of things. By the way, I have literature with those pressure temperatures we were talking about and all your COP and stuff. Uh, there's going to be sensors in your air handlers and your furnaces. I, you know, we didn't touch on that because that wasn't what we were here to talk about. So in other words, as that air is traveling through, it's going to be at the manufacturer. They're going to have a small, even though it's a small little flame propagation for A2Ls, they're still going to put sensors in there. There's going to be a lot of features that's going to change there, obviously, just to make sure it shuts down, isolates the system, and uh, sends off some type of alarm or whatever that looks like on the thermostat. Go ahead. I got a question online. It says, what is the best advice you can give for someone that will use refrigerant for the first time? Wow. The, the uses the refrigerant for the first, all refrigerants? refrigerants or they any? just said use refrigerant, like g g in general. Well, Training. you need to read, yes. get, 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 your, get your manual out. <laughs> Are you licensed? Hopefully you had some training or whatever. Start if with 608, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's another hour. Yeah. If you're using refrigerant for another time, that's a... Find a, a mentor. Yeah. Yes. We, let's, we'll, let's get back to that question there. But, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, there's a new person starting every day in the field, right? Adam. Uh, the storage of your, ta of your tanks on your truck. Right. Do they have to be vertical? Right now, the requirement is vertical. However, as Don mentioned, there's been petitions to DOT to allow for shipping at 45 or horizontal. Those tests have been done, tests have been passed. They're, again, we're waiting on word for them to allow it. At the moment, they are required to be upright, yes. They, they passed the test, it's being submitted, and all we need to do is, you know, how we got everything else sign. works, EPA stuff and all that, you know, OSHA, and it's got to sign off on it. But the testing passed for the horizontal, just so you know. We'd like right. to thank you for sitting and listening to us. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. Big thanks to Don, Jason, and Dr. Chuck for doing this. And as always, big shout out to ESCO Group and to Camores for sponsoring HVAC School, all of our content. They are a really good resource for us as well. It's really great to work with people like Camores and like ESCO who not only want to be part of what we do, but also who produce such great training themselves. Big thanks to them for the partnership. Big thanks to them for their candid conversation about what to look for with flammable refrigerants. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing, you can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.